And there you go. This way we don't have to, we can still chat, but we don't have to miss any of those golden nuggets. Those golden nuggets that you're always sure are going to be there. They're there. They're there. Some, someday it's better to record than to not record. And then something happens and you're like, oh, I wish we'd got that on tape. I wish you would do a podcast or maybe we should do a podcast where that there is no podcast. The podcast is just just the setup (laughs) incidentals set up and talking about um, audio quality and talking about setting up and talking about setting up and and like what we should do differently with the mics. Oh, that would be a great podcast. And then it ends just as it's about to start. Yeah. Happen. Yeah. It it ends when we are like, like, here um, we go. And then the intro music plays and it's actually the outro music. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's so um, avant-garde. Yeah. Meta podcast. All right. So. uh, Today we're going down, down, down. Yeah. Where are we going today, Ben? Well, we can start in the basement or any of the spooky places under the surface of of the earth. We're starting in the basement? We could start in the basement or we could start in a, um, for instance, an abandoned mine. Oh, can I tell you? Well, can I tell you my abandoned mind story? I think you know it, but it might be pertinent to this today's topic. Uh, well, you can always refresh my memory. Do you remember when we, uh, uh, the the Anna and the kids and I, found an abandoned mine shaft? Yes. So Anna came back from a hike and was like, "We found the entrance to a cave. I'm sure of it." And I was like, "Really?" And like in the Shenandoah National Forest, you found the entrance to a cave that nobody else knows is there. That seems odd. And she's, we, we've got to go out and look at it. We've got to go out and look at it. Actually, Zita and her friend found it. And, you know, we walked along the trail and then there's this like like sort of a, a swale coming down off the trail. And there was indeed like this little opening. It looked like it looked almost like a foxhole, like something like an animal burrow that maybe washed a little bit more open. So how Um, big are we talking? Oh, gosh, maybe maybe a foot, foot and a half high, a little bit wider than it is tall on a kind of crumbly slope. Like you could imagine this was been covered, had been covered with leaves and stuff like that. And I I like they had just shined a light in there and I I shined a light in there, too. And, you know, it goes back a ways. And then I was like, this is. This is kind of a big space down here. I think they really did find something. But I didn't go back too far. Instead, we went home and we called uh, like some local, like a local spelunking group or team, people who kind of knew how to do this professionally, I guess. And we all went back there. And it once once we got like I and I crawled back in with them, but we did helmets and lights and everything and all this stuff. And then when we got back to the back of this um, opening in the hillside, like it, it got bigger and bigger. And then. We were standing in a square, a very square space, and there was that realization: like this is a covered-up mine shaft. And along the ground, there were two almost completely rusted away um, tracks. Very in really weird. You think of them as big, heavy iron tracks, like railroad tracks, but these were like thin tracks. Like, like, like even when they were put in, they were probably very wobbly, and. We just, that was it. We just explored this mine shaft. We just went back and back. And it was like, it was one of the most like Dungeons and Dragons things that has ever happened to me. Any idea how old it was? Oh, I, um, like, like in the 1800s, it was, there was a lot of um, uh, iron mining, right? Mm-hmm. So like they were, and it was actually, it's not a mine shaft. It was technically a mine drift, I guess, which is when you, drill into a hillside i suppose and then you just stop and you know at some point so i don't know i actually don't i, I think it means a drift is, is something that goes roughly parallel into a hillside and the shaft is something that goes down um this kind of just went directly <clears throat> in almost a line uh, level into the hill wow so yeah you know, and it was old enough i mean it's old enough that w- what they were pulling it out with was like there were horseshoes down there or mule shoes or whatever um hmm. So it was it was a really fascinating moment. Wow. This is allegedly how Shigeru Miyamoto came up with the idea for the Legend of Zelda. Oh, allegedly. I always say allegedly because I don't always believe creator stories about (laughs) (laughs) 
as 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 someone who is a creator right. and associates with many creators, I believe about a quarter of the stories I hear about people's inspiration. But anyways, allegedly, when he was a child, he was exploring out in the Japanese countryside and would find entrances to caves and had a lantern and stuff. And then, yeah, allegedly, that's it. That's yeah, that's very allegedly like, like Michelangelo allegedly would just see the sculpture of the David inside the stone and just carve out anything that wasn't part of it. Simple. Mm -hmm. He didn't use models or anything. Anyway, no. Oh, that's mean about my, I shouldn't be mean about Michelangelo on the podcast. Sorry. I hear he's a party dude. He is a party. (laughs) Okay. I'm not going to go down the rabbit trail of assigning actual personality types of the Renaissance artists to their corresponding turtles because I love doing that and I'm not going to do that today. Not today. Instead, we're going to delve deep below the sewers at first, although we will reference the Ninja Turtles today, I am sure. Um, But So instead of going down the rabbit trail, though, we are going down the rabbit hole. So today (laughs) we're talking about underground creatures. Yeah. And we've each picked three. And we're ready to go. I now I've I've told you mine in advance, and you have not told me yours. So there, therein lies my surprise. And to decide right. who goes first, I'm going to grab my my treasure chest over here. Astute listeners will remember that uh, we have evolved. We have yeah. a new coin to flip to see who goes first here at the monster market. And it is the Renaissance Fair coin that I keep in my old treasure chest from. 1982 and we flip and we decide if you're going to call out uh, wizard or crown all right here we go wizard or crown one two three call it crown it is indeed crown oh you win all right it's your game zach g it is my game all right so um i'm going to press my advantage i'm going to take my advantage and I'm going to go first. Woo! Okay. And I think this is perfect because actually the first thing that I want to talk about, you know, when we did our mermaid episode, uh, you talked about sort of, we called it mermaid classic. Right. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about the dwarf. Yes. I was, okay, good. Yeah. So I think that... Um, most everybody, you know, a dwarf similar to a mermaid or an elf or a dragon is one of those mythical creatures that everybody knows, right? Like you don't have to have any interest in fantasy or folklore or anything, right? right? Everybody knows what a dwarf is. A dwarf is a small, usually male, but not always, um, Kind of looks like an older person, uh, typically with a you know we think of them as having long beards, and we almost always associate them with if they're not living underground, then they're definitely mining, right? So in other words, we think about like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Well, they lived in a cottage, but what did they do? They they were miners. Hi ho, yes. So dwarves, um, you know, just just as a sort of disclaimer, something that. Um, I think we we need to clarify is that although they share a term, the the dwarf that we're talking about is not related, obviously, <laughs> to uh, what we would call today as a little person, right. right? So they are not so you know, fairy tales and mythology that talk about dwarves are not they're not using an archaic term for a human being. Right, so there, there, there's been a little bit of controversy about that. Mm. It feels like an unfortunate usage of the same word. Right, yeah. right. So just to get that out of the way, stuff. yeah. Um, so dwarves, as we typically think about them, you know, there, there are sort of there, there are sort of dwarf-like and dwarf-adjacent creatures throughout world mythology, but the kind of dwarf that we're talking about or that I'm talking about really comes from that. Uh, Germanic Nordic tradition of of mythology. So, something that that that. So I, I sort of found two things really interesting as I was reading about this. One is sort of how consistent 
dwarves are mm. in in our mythology and folklore. There's, you know, like when we talk about elves, for example, there is a really wide description. There are there's a really wide sort of definition that someone could define an elf right. all the way from, you know, there are people who would describe an elf as you know, like like a fairy, like little lots of you know, small elves little and fairy, yeah, wings, yeah, um, Santa's elves, yeah. you know, the elf on the shelf, all the way up to you know Tolkien's elves who are tall and fair and you know aloof and all that. But with dwarves throughout all of their depictions, including ancient depictions, um, there's a lot of consistency, and I think that in some ways I find that really cool because. Dwarves themselves are consistent. If, it means if they're that real. Makes sense. Like they're, they're. What'd you say? I said it means they're real. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Consistent reports. <laughs> um, but yeah, but like I mentioned before, like consistently, you know, they are short. Uh, they are often depicted as male, though not always. Uh, and this is including in ancient myths and fairy tales. There are plenty of stories of female dwarves that is mm. you know that is part of their biology uh beards um and associated with the underground with drinking was another thing that uh is really consistent that there there's always an association there's often an association with drinking and you know we think about sort of like dungeons and dragons or warcraft dwarves right mm -hmm. having like the big tankard of a yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that and that actually has a lot of um has a lot of 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 precedent to it um but also like i said uh underground and and treasure and mining and and things like that all very consistent now the other half that i had said that i sort of um that I was not aware of and that I found very interesting. And this is, again, this is, we say this all the time. That this is one of the best parts about this thing is you start delving into something that you think you know a lot about mm -hmm. and you're like, huh, wow. So particularly in uh, early tales, there's a lot of association with dwarves and sleep or even death. Hmm. And you say to yourself, well, that sounds interesting. That sounds odd. Like, I, I don't really associate dwarves with sleep. But to take it back, think about, again, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Well, what happens? She goes to their cottage and she falls asleep. Yeah. And then remember, when she's poisoned, what do they do? They craft a glass coffin and they put her in basically like a magic sleep until she can be revived. Hmm. And, and this is where we really start getting, getting deep. So in the early Anglo-Saxon language, the word dwarf actually shares a root with the same words for sleep and dream. And there's actually a 10th century book of charms and prayers known as the Laknunga which is the old English word for remedies. And inside there is a charm called the Wio Duor. I'm probably not pronouncing it right. I'm not a <laughs> scholar in, in ancient Anglo-Saxon Germanic languages. But that the but Wio Duor actually translates as against a dwarf. Okay. And it is specifically a charm or a smell spell a smell? Could a spell a to uh to help with sleeping maladies. Okay. So, cause the idea is that you would, uh, it actually involves you writing the names of s the seven sleepers on wafers and performing a ritual to rid the dwarf who is disrupting your sleep. Oh, now I talked about, uh, again, I talked about the dwarven association with, with drink. And right. this also comes directly from Norse mythology, where dwarves make something called the mead of poetry. Okay. And the mead of poetry grants knowledge to whoever drinks it. Uh, actually, this was something that Odin himself drank and sort of became inspired and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so, so they have that association. Um, as far as the sort of the idea of, of 
digging and treasure and building. This is also uh, rooted in Nordic tradition. So in Nordic mythology, every single item, every single artifact, every single magical thing is constructed by the dwarves. So this includes Thor's hammer. This includes uh, the chains or the cords that bind Fenrir. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. In the Norse creation myth, uh, the first two first humans are created from trees. Okay. And um, in a lot of versions, the dwarves actually created those those first two humans, mm. um, whereas it's the gods who gave them life. Right. But you see again this this dwarven connection to sort of making of fantastic, wonderful items and and mechanisms and things like that. Yeah. Now, anybody who is a fan of Tolkien will probably start to already hear (laughs) similarities, right? Of course. And he, yes, he drew a lot from all of these Norse myths and Germanic traditions and things like that. And the idea of dwarves as treasure and all this, you know, and like I said, you know, building of magical items, things like that. Now, can, can I ask um, a question and you, yeah. that you might not know the answer to, but like, I do know that sometimes I've read it. Is Tolkien the one who introduced the V into the plural dwarves or? You're getting ahead of me. Oh, I am. Okay. I'm curious about that. <laughs> Go ahead. All will, all will be revealed. Okay. So before I get to that, so so uh, in the the prose Edda, which is sort of like uh, the written account of Norse Norse tradition and Norse mythology, there are lots and lots of named dwarfs. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have a few names here. And tell me if these sound familiar. Uh, so dwarves that are named in the ancient uh, uh, Norse tradition have names like uh, Biffer. <laughs> Oh, nice. <laughs> Bomber. Okay. Dane. Ah. Uh. Durin. <gasps> Dwalin. Fili. And uh, a very important dwarf named Gandalf. Wow. And yeah. in Norse, Gandalf actually means wand elf. Oh, my. So, because also there was sort of less of a distinction in the early days between dwarves and elves, mm-hmm, they, right. they, there was some overlap, but, uh, but Gandalf was a dwarf. Now you asked me about Tolkien. Yes. Tolkien actually did say in, in early notes in an early letter that Gandalf was the name that he was going to give to the leader of the dwarves in the Hobbit. Oh, interesting. Before giving it to the name of the wizard in the Hobbit and naming the leader of the dwarves Thorin. That's interesting. Wow. Now to answer your earlier question. Yeah. <laughs> so the the more grammatically correct uh the more grammatically accepted plural for dwarf is dwarfs. Okay. D W A R F S. Okay. And you're right. It was J R R Tolkien. It was hot who diggity. changed the F to a V and in fact in a letter he uh, someone asked him about this, uh-huh. and he wrote, "I'm going to try to do my best Tolkien oh, good. impression." I'd expect nothing less. <clears throat> so imagine I've got a waistcoat and a, and a pipe. Uh, that's how I think of you always. That's misguided, but all right. <laughs> <clears throat> so in a in a in a 1937 letter, Tolkien uh, answered this question. He said, well, uh, I'm, "I'm afraid it's it's it's." It's just a, a piece of private bad grammar, uh, rather shocking in a, in a philologist, but uh, I, sh- I shall have to go with it. Wow. So basically, that he's saying his explanation. That I love his explanation is, yeah, I screwed up, but I'm, I guess I'm stuck with it now. I, ever sometimes I hear these things in, in, in interviews about him, and it it makes me like him more because <laughs> it's easy to it's easy to look at the work and imagine him as, as stuffier than I think he really was. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. that's cool. So yeah, so that's some of the stuff that I picked up on on dwarves. Um, oh, interesting little factoid too. Um, also in the in the earlier days, um, 
dwarves uh, couldn't bear the sunlight. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, there are stories of dwarves turning to stone, much in the way that that uh, we think of trolls as turning to stone. Okay. So I thought that was an interesting little uh, tidbit as well. That is very cool. And I also just love this this Lakanunga again. This it's basically a book of spells, right? And and you can look it up, and it's it's in like uh, I don't know, it's in some british archive but like actually so I, I i love finding that like real world magic nonsense I yeah yeah well for my first one i'm gonna go for uh what might be i don't know i'm not sure but might be the second most uh iconic of the underground um i don't know creatures types from from folklore and mythology um dinosaurs because they never really existed exactly i'm we're going to talk about hollow earth and the dinosaurs uh which i call proto dwarves no i'm going to talk (laughs) about gnomes Mm. uh and it's interesting oh listening to you talk about dwarves uh, a lot of this feels very 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 old and and it may when i mentioned to anna that we were doing a thing about the, the underground you know, things in the underground, she was like, she was quick to start diving into all the symbolic nature of, of, you know, things that we push down underneath us, you know, we bury our dead, uh, mm. stuff like this. And also mm-hmm. how kind of uh, a good point is how revolutionary it was for humans probably to start pulling wealth from the earth, right? When the ages of metals come along, we're suddenly, um, you know, iron and bronze and like we're pulling wealth from the earth and so i start wondering about the dwarves and like like it it makes sense that that would be very very old that idea and also i just wonder i don't know we do have a a stereotypical or sort of like archetypal kind of idea of what a miner and a and a and a blacksmith looks like yeah and it's kind of dwarvish right a little bit right and you sort of wonder like which came first you do exactly it makes me wonder mm. which came first uh gnomes on the other hand as far as i my reading goes and there's a little bit of there's just a touch of uh, uh of uncertainty here but it seems like well and just to interrupt you for a sure. second i just want to say like i'm also I, i'm i'm very interested in what you're about to say because i sort of think of like to me in my brain, gnomes, there's a little bit of a bifurcation. Mm-hmm. I can sort of think, it's almost like I can think of like two different types. So right. I, just putting that out there. And I think you're right. And that's 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 what it kind of seemed to be. But it seems like the first person, it seems like the word gnome um, comes from uh, an alchemist in, in the Renaissance. So when we're talking folklorically, I feel like the Renaissance is pretty modern in terms of yeah of stories, that's sort of right? relatively late yeah it's relatively late and so I, it seems like the first person to say gnome was a an alchemist uh philosopher hermeticist called uh and again uh this whole podcast is going to be about getting pronunciations wrong but paracelsus oh nice uh 15 mi- middle of the 1500s right he comes up with this idea of embodiments of of the four elements right and so uh, earth Earth elementals he calls gnomes. Uh, undines are the elementals of waters. Uh, of course, fire is salamanders. And mm-hmm. he apparently invents the idea of sylphs for the air. And then he uh, delineates man as number five. Because in man, there's the presence of... Heart. Oh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> with, yes or you know well heart it, exactly actually it's the quintessence uh this fifth mm-hmm. essence uh maybe has man and is a, is what sparks life so in a sense absolutely um and that seems to be where gnomes like 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 the name gnome comes from and you know tied to the earth um but then it also says in like i always i always I'm citing the Carol Rose Spirits, Fairies, Leprechauns, and Goblins Encyclopedia. And that says both, it, it mentions Paracelsus, but it also talks about in Teutonic mythology, these earth sprites closely resemble dwarves. 
dwarfs, actually, and that they were small, stocky, grotesque beings. They invariably appeared like old men in monks' habits mm. and dwell in the earth. So, like, I don't know. It it still seems to my reading that, that Paracelsus was the first person to say gnome. And I think um, after that, it was bound up, I think, with the idea of, of dwarfs or dwarves. <laughs> I was going to say, is it possible that maybe the concept comes from Teutonic folklore? Right. Because because that's that was my that's I guess what I thought as well. Right. Because, yeah, like the four, you know, salamanders and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that maybe gnome is a more modern name that this fella Right, I think attributed. I think you're right, and also I think that it's uh, like having gnome come in late as a as a a separate or you know a, its own kind of concept allows us to like yeah it, like you were saying split sort of dwarfs and gnomes, and then the gnome it seems to be still still a bit in development as is coming into its own as a as a type, um, because you know like like these are elemental spirits like even in the, the alchemical sense, elemental spirits protecting wealth. Um, and they're, they're small because, you know, tunnels are small. Um, so I, I had some Tolkien stuff too, just in the, in the idea that I think <sighs> Tolkien pulled some of the, that he gave us so much underground stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I almost, I think more than, than actual mythology has, if that makes sense. Like, like to me, Tolkien sort of, he gives us all these, like almost more creatures live underground than live overground in, in Tolkien, right? You have dwarves, you have orcs slash goblins with their long tunnels. Hobbits live underground. Mm. And mm -hmm. like all mm -hmm. this, like hero's journey stuff where you, you go down in the cave to face either the dragon or to find wisdom, right? right. That happens. Right. Both of those things happen in The Hobbit, right? He goes underground mm -hmm. to face the dragon and he goes underground to get wisdom or the ring or whatever it is. And, and, you know, that is trading riddles with Gollum. And then there's this concept that if you delve too deep, you get to the, the you, you can delve too deep and get to something horrible, which is the Balrog, right? So there's just so right. much stuff in the, in the underground. Um, but he doesn't, he doesn't do gnomes. He he really he really sticks it to he sticks to the sort of like the Germanic northern mythologies. Um, mm -hmm. When I hear Renaissance, you know, where was this fellow from? He was um, oh German. I guess he's German. So um, okay. So we're still we're still in that area. But I feel like here's what I feel like. I feel like the concept of gnome is still something that's under development. And the reason I feel like that is because um, a lot of like more modern uh, fantasy and fairy tale stories are still sort of developing the gnome idea. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking of um, C.S. Lewis's gnomes in the land of Bism um, and how they were all, they're very different from dwarves. They're, um, they're little gray, like earthy looking creatures almost like clay creatures and they're all different they all have like weird different attributes some have antlers mm. some have bulbous noses some are short some are tall they have nothing in common you know physically except it seems like the substance that they're kind of formed out of which i think is so would you say that that even in these editions of gnome there's still a very like elemental component to them like like more elemental than the dwarf where like a dwarf lives underground but a gnome is almost is the ground yes yes and i think that um i think that's what and i i don't know the books as well as i like but i know that um return to oz hit me very strongly with the gnome king and i think that that's almost oh a, right who's just like made out he's of like just the rock, made out he? of the rock yeah and i right. think that's an almost perfection of the idea of gnome and where that idea is kind of kind of going so yeah and that's uh th that's what i have pretty much with gnomes um i did like it did send me on a on a path thinking about um the way there's a thing that that c.s lewis does it, it got me on that path of because i wanted to look up, i was looking up the the gnomes of bism and then i i remembered that in that 
um, uh, they get a glimpse of a world yet below, like this sort of like lot, bright shining fire world. The gnomes are jumping into it to go back home, right? Mm-hmm. The, these gnomes, mm-hmm. they were actually up too high and they're, they're jumping in to get to this land below and they glimpse this world and they're like, oh, there's this whole other world that really has nothing to do with the, the surface world of Narnia. And so what, um, I, just to go on about C.S. Lewis a little bit more, because when I was thinking about that scene, I thought, you know what? He's pulled this trick twice. And I thought he did this in Paralandra too. And I looked up uh, the story of Paralandra in, in the space trilogy. And sure enough, he had done the same thing. Now in Paralandra, uh, and so I won't assume too much uh, listener knowledge, uh, our main character ransom he has he has been to mars now he is transported to venus which is a world that is just starting out and there are there is basically an adam and eve um analog characters but this world is a surface world of islands almost like floating islands on a sea and there ends up being a sort of uh tempter character much like the snake in the garden except it's it's a it's inhabiting a human body of this guy who who brought Ransom to Paralandra or Venus and they end up fighting in this underground cavern. And it must have been this really interesting idea to him because the same thing happens where he ends up deep underground and he looks down. So this is a brand, like the surface world is brand new. There's like, like the first, you know, human intelligent adjacent characters are on the surface of this world but he looks down into the underworld and he sees like a chariot pulled by like some kind of like multi-legged insectoid salamander thing with this like robed figure of fire on top of it and he's like that that is a whole nother world that has again it's it's the same scene he's like this is a world that has nothing to do with me Mm -hmm. and i am just glimpsing it and now i'm going back to the surface and it's just like like that idea was really lodged. It it makes me interested in Lewis all the more that he that that idea was so fixed that he did it twice. I also just as a side note, I love like I love how he gets kind of pulpy with that stuff with his science fiction stuff. Yeah, I wish he would more. Yeah. I, I wish he would have. Well, yeah. I'm not going to go down that trail, but <laughs> I, I I love I love it when his brain is going in that direction. And, and so. One question before we wrap up gnomes sure. is I'm sure that there are people saying gnomes, like part of the earth, what are you talking about? Like gnomes are the little guys with the red hats. Yes. So did you? Yes. And they they have the, my explanation for that, and I, this is going to be conjecture really, is that gnome, you know, as a, fairly new conceptual word or whatever you know has been applied to other uh creatures and other um folklore traditions as they've been i don't know moved into english because we we also i also grew up of course with uh the cartoon david the gnome and gnomes when in the book that it was based on gnomes with its glorious uh illustration it's a great book was originally pub- I just looked it up. Is it was originally published in Dutch in 1976. And what was the so, Dutch title? Tell me that. Do you can you get it? Leven en Werken van de Kabouter. The Kabouter? Is that like ka- the, ka- Kabouter? Is that like? The, but it's not. It doesn't say gnomes, does it? Uh, you know what? It doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's it's see, I, it's I, translated as life and work of the gnomes, and so. Living and working, so it's obviously like living and working yeah. with the kabuter, and so I, I don't speak Dutch, but and yeah, kabuter wonder... is is going to be something closer to kobold or goblin, right? Yeah, and, and I think to, yeah, because kobold and goblin share a, like linguistically, is that's, basically that's a what German... that is. Yeah, right. Yeah, so this is this is more like the goblins or the elves, um, and I think that gnome was a word that was pulled in for. Um, English, English language. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was just uh, put there, but huh. it goes back a ways because the other thing I, uh, the other cool. Um, oh, 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 sorry. I'm interrupting you, go ahead, but, go ahead. But, but, but well, uh, right. Cause so like, I just looked up Kabuter. Okay. And it can also be translated as elf or goblin. Okay. So it really is this, this sort of 
fairy realm where things don't always have clear categorizations. Right. Um, but this is all very interesting. Yeah. So, but I think, I think, so I think part of that happened in, in, in the romantic movement. Right. And what the one thing I did find on Wikipedia was a picture, an illustration of a gnome. And I, I, I'd urge you to look this up. It's, it's actually pretty cool. Gnome watching a railway train. Um, huh. So he's, he's in a sort of like, like closed in forest space, kind of looking out almost of a cave entrance or a forest tunnel at a field far away with a, with a train going by in the distance. And you can see it, like he, he looks a little bit like not quite the peaked hat, but, but he looks very David the gnomish. And he's wa- lo- looking out over this. And this illustration was by Carl Spitzwig. I just found it. Yeah. And he is like, once you realize that, you're like, oh, I know his work. He's mm-hmm. he's he's quite good. And he's he's you'll, you've probably at least seen the bookworm, which is this old man on a on a ladder. And I've got like a, a print of that. And, 1848. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, I think I think Gnome got sort of the the word got sort of co-opted over into the english uh at around that time you know this all makes sense too given that that book was published in uh the the gnomes book was published in 1976 and then translated to english in 1979 which is after c.s lewis and and others were writing about gnomes and the gnomes that in their stories were the more elemental underground there it is yeah there it is yeah so, um, huh. so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's gnomes. Um, and I think that they're, uh, don't trust the garden statues. Don't trust what big gnome has been <laughs> shoving down your throats <laughs> big gnome. for 40 years. Oh, no. oh gosh. Yeah. Big so garden. We're going to, um, so anyway, I think gnomes are, 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 as, as elementals are very clean in a way, right? Good. This is good, clean dirt. I'm going to move on to muddier territory next. Well, for my, so then if it's time for me for my next one, I'm also going to move to muddier territory. Woohoo! Or not necessarily muddier, but but murkier. Maybe. Dirtier. Dirt, definitely dirtier. So I'm going to take you, we're going to, we're going to travel these tunnels and uh, we're going to head to Serbia. Ooh. And in Serbia, there is a type of, really a type of boogeyman. Uh, a mysterious creature and it lurks quietly in the dark in abandoned places including holes in the ground okay and the name of this creature is the balk say it again uk b-a-u-k balk and its name is actually derived from bo which is the serbian equivalent of saying boo to someone so the balk is, uh, we don't really know what the balk looks like because most people that encounter the balk don't necessarily survive to tell the tale. Um, but, it, it, but it is said uh, to somewhat resemble a bear. There seems to be some correlation. Maybe it has sort of bear-like qualities, um, but it, it has red glowing eyes and teeth. Sometimes it has horns, things like that. Um, mostly, mostly it's known by its eerie sound, uh, which croaks from its throat, and it's described as nails scraping across wood. Ooh. Now, the boak is absolutely a predator, uh, but it doesn't hunt. What it does is um, it, it, it lurks, because it, it allegedly has a very clumsy and awkward gait. So what it does is uh, it, it, it skulks in the shadows or, again, like I mentioned, like in a cave or in a hole in the ground. And it just waits for somebody unsuspecting to come by and grabs them and drags them into the darkness or drags them underground and has its, uh, has its meal. But don't worry, because uh, if you're ever out, if you're in that mine shaft again and you think there might be a boak, Here's what you do. It's afraid of two things. It's afraid of bright light and it's afraid of loud noises. Hmm. So if you have a flashlight, just shine your flashlight at it 
and scream real loud and it'll 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 run away um also if you can expose it to direct sunlight the direct sunlight will kill it Mm. once again uh you know here's another example of a creature who is whose function is mostly to to scare children yeah right yeah be good or the boke will get you Mm -hmm. um you know don't don't go into that space or the boke will get you that that it might actually be dangerous that space right holes and uh kind of like kind of like uh your your luca basla yeah yeah (laughs) so there's there's not a heck of a lot more really to say about the boke um but uh, i like that it that it, it it fits that boogeyman archetype you know, I like the idea that it's it's actually really clumsy. You know, mm-hmm. it's this really frightening thing, but it's clumsy. Yeah. And so that's why it has to kind of ambush ambush its prey. And specifically talking about holes in the ground. I mean, like, I also I love this this visual of like a hole horizontally on the ground, and then just like these, you know, claws come up out of it or something. Yes. And grab somebody. And the sit, the sit and wait predator is is something like that. Well, we've reached the halfway point. We have, at, and, and I was that, at that point. I was going to ask you if you had any book recommendations. Um, I don't. Do you? I do. I have two. Oh, okay, good. I have two of them. Can uh, you just put my name on one of them? I'll, I'll, one can be from you. I'll let the, this. The first one is, is your recommendation. Okay. It is a book called that I know you've read. It's called uh, Jim Henson by Brian J. Jones. Oh, I have read that. Yeah, I know. I, I was I gonna think, be, I was gonna be snide about it, but, but I. Oh no, I think you recommended <laughs> this book to me. I think this—that's the reason I read it. Okay. Uh, some years ago, but anyway, uh, I—it's—it's it's a book that I lent out to somebody, and, and um, you know, sometimes the books come back, sometimes they don't. So I was like at the library, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna check this out from the library again, <laughs> and I was like, I need to replace this book and have it on my shelf because I, I love it. It's, it's a, it's the best uh, biography of Jim Henson that I've read. Um, yeah, I think it is. I think it is largely the the. It's it's sort of the definitive. It's the one. Yeah. yeah, and and it's it's his life is endlessly inspirational. And what does this have to do with the underground? Well, there's Fraggle Rock, mm. and that was such a. Like I, I I under I it's easy for me to forget or underestimate how much Fraggle Rock uh, affected my growing sensibilities sensibilities and imagination right like i loved radishes. like fraggle rock was oh. what <laughs> i love you that. love radishes <laughs> i love radishes and doozer sticks mm-hmm. um no i just I, but that's it like i love the uh, the undergroundiness of it and the the sizes yeah. you have humans and uh what the gorgs is it the gorgs yep Yes, and the Fraggles and the Doozers, and they all are operating on different like size levels, and it's just everything about Fraggle Rock was great, and the the idea that when Jim Henson <laughs> made it, he was like, "Let's make a show that will end war." <laughs> <laughs> it's just like that's great. That yeah. like, shoot, shoot, shoot for the stars, man. I love mm-hmm. that man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's your book. That was my book. Yes, but highly recommended. <laughs> Mine is a book called uh, Access All Areas. A User's Guide to the Art of Urban Exploration Mm. by Ninjalicious. All right. On the cover, it says Infiltration Presents. This is a book that came out in 2005 when the whole urban exploration movement. um, I was going to say, is he like a TikToker or something? But not if it was No, it was when this whole urban exploration uh, uh, trend was starting and people would have blogs about like um, getting into places where, you know, you're kind of not supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And there is a whole um, sec. Now, now he, he passed away uh, in 2005. Oh, wow. uh, I think when right when the book came out, but I had found like his blog and stuff. And, and it's just like there's some really interesting. There's a whole section of, of finding underground um, of exploring places you really shouldn't be in and, and it places that are probably actually unsafe to be in like drainage places and things like that right but condemned all, buildings all of that said it is very interesting the other thing that i find that is so uh charming about this book is there's a whole section on um uh, social engineering and you know uh like how to just when people ask you questions just kind of let them talk and smile and, you know how, how to feel like you belong and so one of the places that he liked to uh infiltrate was just like fancy people parties 
Uh-huh. So, and which to me, like, seems like the best and most harmless one. He would just go to, like, hotels where there were big parties going on and just, you know, dress uh, unobtrusively but nicely and walk in and talk to people and have snacks and, and go. <laughs> he's, so, like, he's so definitely a roguish fella. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> um, that's a book that I, I don't even know if you can still get it. I imagine you can still find it on Amazon, but I, I, I as a curio, I, I really like it. Nice. So, those are my, my recommendations. Is that is that sort of like around the same era where geocaching got big, or is geocaching uh, yeah. earlier? No, geocaching was probably slightly later. Oh, okay, but not much, not by much, mm-hmm. right? Like that's I, I think geocaching's like two two thousand eight to two thousand ten, but that's just my yeah. Because I feel like that I feel like there's in the Venn diagram there's a lot of overlap between urban exploration and geocaching. Oh yes, oh yeah. Okay, this was this is a tough one. Oh. My next one is the Mole Man. <laughs> and I mean I mean the Mole Man from Fantastic Four number 1, oh 1961. Okay. Uh, which is a bit of a departure probably from what, what we're talking about, but I <laughs> I think that the Mole Man is an important I know it, like it's not really a folkloric creature and um a, or or even a, a cryptid or a modern myth but i think i think the mole man uh sort of changed thinking about i i think the mole man sort of represents a changed thinking about uh about our underworld mm. um i think he's everything that like i think he's a, a a new way of thinking about underground creatures now that like in a in a sort of modern sense where there is mining and industry and we've moved sort of from the ancientness of of picking uh, wealth from the ground with with you know shovels and spades and picks and all that stuff and gems, and we've gone on to sort of deeper tunnels and what could be um, in those you know like, like those deeper levels of of the underground. Um, and did I we dig too deep? It, he, did we dig too deep? I think the mole man is the promise of the Balrog, maybe. I don't know, but I think <laughs> that. Um, but I think that I, I think that what has happened between um, uh, between the dwar the dwarfs and the mole man is uh, the rise of like subterranean fiction, which mm-hmm. uh, of which you know, like I think Dante uh, uh, qualifies as a very early version of subterranean fiction, where like he he goes he goes deep into the underground and, and like actually emerges on another uh uh hemisphere right mm, mm-hmm, uh mm-hmm. he's actually going kind of through the center of the earth or at least hell is is like that pit that, that satan has fallen into is 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 definitely mountains deep um and then you know that that moves on to uh jules verne's journey to the center of the earth and we've also had uh this concept of i think the morlocks from the time machine Yep. Um, oh, Wells is Morlocks. I'm sorry. J- Jules Verne is Journey, Journey to the Center of the Earth. And he's got Mole Man. And yeah. And that's the other thing. And he's got, um, he's got like this thing that feels a lot like what Lewis does, where they, uh, it's been, it's been a long time since I've looked at it, but like there's like they, they, they encounter like a, a man with, is, with like a herd underground, like an early human, but he's like huge. Hmm. And they're like, well, let's just leave, you know, we'll see this like very, very different being from a distance and then go. Oh, okay. Anyway. And then, and, you know, they, they, but there's that whole like kind of center of the earth, hollow earth, prehistoric um, things of the depths uh, that I think helped birth the, the concept of the mole man. And yeah. Well, there, there's also a movie called The Mole Man. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it's an old black and white uh, sci-fi. And what's funny is um, there is a Mystery Science Theater episode where they do that movie. Um, okay. But I actually kind of genuinely like the movie. Like, I would watch the movie oh. on its own. <laughs> yeah. But it's sure. it's it's exactly what you... It, it's exactly all that stuff. It's like archaeologists yeah. find ruins and they dig too deep and they accidentally uh, come across a... a civilization of mole people yeah and um and then there's like a there's also like the mole people are i think the mole people are enslaved by another 
group who are more human like well the mole man himself is like rules over the moloids um <laughs> so fantastic four's mole man rules over these like like he's he's a he it, 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 at the root of it he's a he's a he's a not even a super powered human right he's like a guy who lives underground and can no longer stand the sun but he mm-hmm. rules over like this these creatures the moloids that were living underground and now he commands them <laughs> and um and i just i do think he t- he he sort of is like 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 this emergent embodiment of of the new underground right in a way gosh now i'm back on c.s lewis I don't, I'm going to take one more C.S. Lewis aside because I think this idea, I wondered when I was thinking about Journey to the Center of the Earth and that fleeting encounter with the like 12 foot tall guy herding mastodons and then they leave. I wonder if like, like you got to imagine that Lewis read Burn, right? He would have had to have, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, I wonder if that like struck him because he does these fleeting encounters. He'll, he'll, he's done that like. Like I like I know what he did in Paralandra, he did it in um in Narnia, and then in the other in uh Voyage of the Dawn Treader, there's that moment when Lucy looks down under the sea and sees this uh little mermaid girl. Mm-hmm. And they look at each other for just a moment as the ship's going by, and they're like, Oh, we're friends. But we'll never see each other again and our worlds do not touch. Yeah. And that's the, and it's like there's these haunting, fleeting encounters that he seems to come back and back to. But this isn't a podcast about C.S. Lewis. It's a podcast <laughs> about folklore in the underworld. So um, I guess the other thing I was I would think about with with the mole man that comes to mind, uh, the other sort of emergent thing that had, would have happened in the, in the between times would be a lot of um, natural science studies mm-hmm. and sort of like studies of like real studies of ant colonies and specifically i think um i and this is maybe my own interest is naked mole rats have you ever gone to the zoo and watched a naked mole rat colony sure it's great yeah they're so weird they are these wonderful they're they are like fantasy creatures these weird hairless toothy things living in in long like living like ants in a colony i love it i will never forget the first time that uh, i went and saw that with my dad at the zoo. and i aren't naked mole rats like actually like um um what am i trying to say like like they're they're very ugly but like uh they don't they actually have like very like loving caring colonies or something yeah i think like, they like they seem to work in a com- in a communal yeah they're not they are working together so they're yeah. these um yeah it's 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 inspirational i guess in a way <laughs> <laughs> these these things that to us like are you know homely but all wonderfully working together um, so you can so you can draw lines just to just to tie it. You could draw lines between Jules Verne, C.S. Lewis, and Stan underground Lee. fiction, uh, and all the way back to Dante and Stanley. That is what I'm sort of getting at with with the Mole Man as sort of being man. drawing on all of that stuff. So and, the Mole Man being the most contemporary. Yeah, the the yeah sort of like a, an embodied character of the of. Uh, sort of the cha- psychological change about the underworld or underground that had happened bet- after uh, dwarves, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's that's my thing, I guess. And it also, and I'm also going to take one. There are two things I want to do to to close out Mole Man. The version of the Mole Man that comes up in the at the end of the Incredibles is the Underminer. Do you remember mm-hmm. the end of the Incredibles? Yeah. And that's why that's why the Mole Man. That's. The, I think that that was the 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 great the great broken promise of the Incredibles two was that it didn't make good on what that was, because to me that was that cover that Fantastic Four cover is but is is a wonderful signpost of the move from the kind of Golden Age stories definitely to Silver Age stories Golden mm-hmm. Age stories being you know we're fighting mad scientists right. To, to Silver Age stories being like, we're, we're suddenly we're fighting horrors from the deep or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, it, it becomes stranger and weirder. And with the Mole Man coming up or with the Underminer 
uh, he's here to declare a war on peace and happiness. I have, I am beneath you, but nothing is beneath me. He comes up out of the earth and you're like, oh, brilliant. Here at the end of this movie where we've been fighting a mad scientist, everything is like theoretically possible except the superpowers. Now we've moved on to there are like worlds below us. Like we've moved into the Silver Age. And then mm-hmm. in the second in the second one, it's just like, oh, no, we're back into technology and and fighting rich bad guys so i mean they dispatched the underminer really quickly anyway i just felt like that was such a missed opportunity always um <laughs> but i do love that underminer and how how closely he is uh, a callback to mole man and how that is a movement so the other thing finally i would like to read a passage from robert mcfarland's underland a deep time journey uh, because I think he kind of sum- on a again pulled this book out for me, but I think it kind of sums up a little bit about what's happening or what how we view the underworld differently in this sort of age of deep mining. Okay. So this is a passage about he's he's gone to look at um, sort of like a, a deep deep salt mine where like we're miles below the earth, and there's these huge uh, mining machines burrowing under the soil or under the under the earth deep into the salt and i think the idea is to measure gamma radiation and look for like a t- it's always to find, gamma radiation yeah try to define dark matter or something like this but he says what curious partners they become in the darkness the mine and the laboratory oddly echoic of each other's operations the geologists sending their probes out into the rock ahead hoping to detect and pursue the most remunerative seams the physicists watching for the arrival of knowledge pure knowledge the sylvite of knowledge, hard to reach, worth nothing, hoping to detect the missing portion of the universe. Dark matter, a yield that cannot be sold. Neil leans in close again, cups his hands to shout into my ears above the noise of extraction. Those face mining machines, they cost 3.2 million pounds each. The engines are modified, obviously, to prevent sparking. We bring them down in sections in the lift shaft, assemble them in build-up bays, and then drive them out to the production face towing a generator behind them. It takes them three days to trundle the seven or so miles out here to where they begin work. The strains of the work are intense, the lifespan of the machines short. When one of them reaches the end of its useful days, says Neil, it's not cost effective to bring it back up. It would take the place, it'd take the place of ore in the upshaft and that's too expensive. So instead, the machine gets driven into a worked out tunnel of rock salt and abandoned there. The halite will flow around it as the tunnel naturally closes up. It's an astonishing image, the translucent halite melting around this cybernetic dragon, the fossilization of this machine relic in its burial shroud of salt. So yeah, we have these huge mining machines (laughs) buried in salt under the earth to be dug up by, I guess, the mole men. So for my uh, final monster today is something called the Groot Slang. Now, I promise that whatever image you conjure when I say Groot slang is wrong. It's, it's okay. not what this thing is. So in South Africa, now I, sp- I specifically thought of you when, when I discovered the Groot slang, and you'll, you'll see why. Um, but so in South Africa, there is a huge cave that is stuffed with diamonds and jewels. And this cave is actually called the Wonder Hole. (laughs) Now, of course, I thought of you because it reminded me of your uh, your intrigue with the mystery hole, which is something different. (laughs) It is, but that's something we have to. It's still on the docket. Yes. The mystery hole being a a place where a roadside attraction in west virginia yeah well so the wonder hole is sadly not in west virginia it's in south africa but uh it is stuffed with diamonds and jewels and it's said that this cave actually connects to the ocean uh and is the original source for all the diamonds in south africa um so if you were able to get to this cave i mean you could become quite wealthy However, inside this cave lives a beast known as the Groot Slang. 
And the Groot Slang is a massive monster that is a cross between a snake and an elephant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's greedy. It is. That could go so many different ways, too. Right. And and the origin of this thing, uh, again, is is not what you're thinking. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, so the Groot slang is it's it is greedy, it's dangerous, uh, and it basically guards this this giant horde of diamonds and jewels. Um, but it, it's not totally unreasonable. If you were to encounter this thing and you had some jewels of your own, you could uh, trade your life for the jewels. So, so the, the Groot slang can be bargained with. Uh, he just, you know, he's kind of single-minded about jewels and diamonds mm-hmm. and riches and things like that. Uh, so, okay, so the, what's the origin of the Groot slang? Well, you're like, well, it's a cross between a snake and an elephant. Did a snake and an elephant, you know, did they intertwine and, 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 and fall in a puddle of mutagen and become, well, no. The Groot slang is actually as old as time itself. And the gods, Hmm. when they were creating the world, they created many Groot slangs. But it it became clear to the gods pretty quickly that this creature was just, it was too powerful, it was too dangerous, it was too intelligent. And they said, okay, we made a little bit of an oopsie with the Groot slang. (laughs) So what do we do? So they gathered up all the Groot slangs and they separated them into snakes and elephants. Uh, okay. So uh, this is also, uh, so so both snakes and elephants are can be dangerous to humans, but neither one is as dangerous as, as the Groot slang. Uh, but one okay. of these Groot slangs did escape this... Uh, this this division and this is the Groot slang that currently lives in the oh, wonder hole the last Groot slang that lives in the wonder Ex- hole. exactly exactly um now this this uh this creature straddles between sort of mythological creature but also kind of tiptoes into cryptid territory oh okay so um this is a creature for another episode, but do you know what the Mokele Mbembe is? No, I don't. The Mokele Mbembe is the basically the brontosaurus that is believed to still live in the Congo. <gasps> I do know about the oh yes. Right. I am so people have stories. So even though we're talking about two very different parts of the continent, South Africa obviously being in the south and the Congo being way more up in the Mm -hmm. uh, northwest of the continent. Uh, Similarities where you think about the idea of a creature that is a cross between an elephant and a snake. I'm loving this so much. So, so, you know, you can kind of start drawing parallels there. And, um, and also where both are, are described as being very aggressive and very dangerous to, to humans. In fact, as late as 1917, there was an English businessman named Peter Grayson who disappeared in that area, and his death was attributed to the Groot slang. What year was this again? Say? 1917. Okay. Um, but yeah, like a lot of the people in the, in the area said that, yeah, he... He got too close to the Groot slang, and that was the uh, cause of his death and disappearance. So, is this just myth? Or, if the Mokele Mbembe up in the Congo is real, then is the Groot slang also real? And, like I said, the Mokele Mbembe is for another episode, but, you know, (laughs) there are theories about underwater tunnels and caves connecting places. And that's how these creatures have sort of survived. Right. So, um, I don't know who knows. Uh, but again, these, the, these same themes of treasure underground and things guarding treasure and riches. And, you know, it's, it's just ubiquitous. Deeply embedded stuff. Yeah, for sure. Literally deeply embedded. (laughs) 
All right. So we have done um, the mining of antiquity, uh, the underground of antiquity with its jewels. We've done uh, sort of modern, uh, or I've kind of tried to touch on to the like more industrial underworld. And now we're going to get even this is this is gonna be the, the the goopiest dirtiest one because I'm doing I'm I'm going straight into goofier than mole man, even more than the mole man because I'm going to do real cryptid territory and talk about sewer alligators, <laughs> the sewer alligators of New York specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, so fun <laughs> fun fact when I was thinking about doing this one, I remember that for years when I had heard when I had first heard Billy Joel's "We Didn't Start the Fire." From 1989, I one of the lines is "trouble in the Suez," like the Suez Canal. Uh-huh. But I had always heard that as "trouble in the sewers." Sure, yeah. and just assumed that that was a a reference to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> just that was my assumption, and it and like and and you know you like those song lyrics misheard in bed in your mind, and and so that was just how that was in my brain. Years and trouble years. in the sewers trouble in the sewers <laughs> um so uh but yeah so the underworld the underground it's always been a, a place uh where we put things away um we you know we bury the dead um we put them safely underground and um we hope that they stay there <laughs> then in modern times uh sewage and drainage systems got much much larger and so I think psychologically, there's this knowledge that uh, whether or not we're thinking about it, there's a lot of tunnels in underground space, especially in cities below our feet, where we are putting like all the things that we don't want to think about, mostly mm-hmm. our, our waste, right? And waste water and trash flows down there and stuff like that. And, it, and we, we are definitely flushing away things that we don't want to think about. And, um, there, and there's utility tunnels and things like this. And I think... Um, uh scary things stories of scary things being down there were just bound to happen right it got infinitely scarier i think when like stephen king put a clown down there right Mm -hmm. but but it goes way back and um but so trying to look into the the story of the sewer alligators that like the earliest sewer beast stories um that seem to maybe have something to do with the with the what became the the alligator story was in the Victorian times, there were the stories of the black swines in uh, the sewers of Hampstead. What? Um, black swines in the sewers of London, right? Okay. So there's this great story where a pregnant sow falls in, uh, gives birth to a litter of, of pigs, and they just feed on the rats and each other, uh, and you know, so that only the strong are surviving, and they get larger and more beastly and feral. Um, and that was just a, that was an urban legend for the most part. I mean, probably there were escaped swine in London, but it was an urban legend for, uh, for a while in the Victorian times. And it's a believable one in a way because, uh, because pig, feral pigs can be problematic and they can grow humongous. Um, and you got to figure that something as vast as the Victorian underground, underground you know. Yes. And they could like that's like in a way that is more probable than the stories of the sewer alligators. Um, <laughs> because uh, so the idea of those living in America drifts over. Um, it seems like in the 1930s uh, there uh, there's actually there's a great New York Times uh, article that delves into the whole history of the, the the sewer alligators as a story and how far back it goes and it's it's very interesting but uh it seems like but it ha- what's one of the best parts of that is that there are a lot of um uh photos of newspaper clippings and ads and stuff like this so there was a time when um you could like florida was starting to ship alligators to new york and to across the country as pets mm-hmm. and and this was um they were like a dollar fifty, and it was like, what child wouldn't want it's their own tiny alligator? Uh, they're from the time of the dinosaurs, and uh, so this was this was definitely happening, uh-huh. and they were definitely uh, also for sure being abandoned. Um, well, yeah. But, what happens when they grow into a dangerous predator? Well, sadly, the problem is uh, New York is just too cold for them to live through the winter, so. Mm. 
they um there have absolutely been um um alligators found in the sewers mm. and that's just that's just true but they're never large and they and i think uh that, so there was a there was a story about um one of the uh, commissioners of the sewers uh uh in, in the in the thir- mid 30s uh called Teddy May and he did have an account which is seems a little bit dubious like like the the reporting on this seems a little bit uh sensational but finding um uh, a group of alligators none of which were larger than like 2 feet long right so these are not like like the the sewer alligator myth has grown to the th- point that where these are enormous, uh, bone white, nearly blind, sort of mutated creatures living in the underground. So it does seem that like there might have been uh, some of them found in the in the sewers in the mid '30s and baited out to hunters and caught, and then never again um, have there have there really been found any significant alligators in the sewers except. Um, the New York does even to this day, uh, rescue or deal with, um, some number of alligators, some small number of alligators in the city every year, it seems like. Um, but one thing that really got me though, in, in reading about the, the sewer alligators myth through the years and has how it's grown and developed in 1982, the expert of the most durable urban myth weighed in. Um, and this is uh, the, um, the, the, the 1980s New York City sewer chief, whose name was John T. Flaherty. <laughs> and there's a great picture of him. Uh-huh. And <laughs> does he look and exactly like you would imagine? He looks like a Tommy Flaherty. And mm-hmm. so I'm thinking that the T stands for Tommy. Or at least that he's Tommy's brother. Tommy Flaherty is a character from our other podcast. Uh, for any of you listeners who have not listened to the Galaxy of Super Adventure, yes. <laughs> um, but like when I saw this picture and saw the name, I was like, "Oh, this is great!" And the cat, like, um, the caption to the picture says, uh, T- "John T. Flaherty about to descend into the Manhattan sewer. The alligator on his sweater was the only one to be found in the entire system." <laughs> <laughs> he's wearing a tie and he's got the little sweater with the little alligator on it and it's just it, just fantastic so <laughs> tommy flaherty said no alligators in the new york sewers in 1982 um he's just trying to cover up the conspiracy. he's just trying to cover it up um but it like the the story uh, it certainly lived on there's there are still like sculptures in the subway uh there's a, a bronze sculpture of an alligator coming up out of a manhole stuff like this so uh and and we can and we saw in a previous episode um you know how quickly the chupacabra story spread from right yeah well from, uh, and this story is even older than that yeah because the chupacabra was what the 90s the mid 90s yeah and by within two years it had made an x-files episode yeah. So 1930s America seems to be where the sewer gators story started started up, and and I'm actually surprised that it's even that old. Um, right. Yeah. yeah for sure. That, that for sure. But on the other hand, like that's when those like back of the magazine article like things where you can get itching powder, a baby <laughs> alligator. Yeah, I was gonna it, say you know. probably yeah, like uh, probably when you could get an alligator shipped to you. No questions asked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've seen old comic book ads where you could buy monkeys. Oh, golly. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and that's real. Yeah. It's crazy. So that's it. So, so that's like, so we can imagine how quickly a story like that would spread. And it definitely, definitely has gone into the, the uh, cultural consciousness. Uh, we have, um, again, uh, another Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. To tie it back up to TMNT, we have Leatherhead. Yeah, uh, who is just exactly a, a sewer croc, a sewer alligator mutated, right. and uh, like Killer Croc from Batman, mm-hmm. kind of kind of the same character. Uh, so there you go. And you know, it's funny. Uh, it also taps. It, it also ticks that primordial fear box. I I, I know that when I um, <laughs> I live in Virginia, and sometimes in the summer I swim around in the Shenandoah River. And I know there are no alligators there. I know it. Do you? 
But do I? Do you? When I'm swimming on my own in the Shandor River, I do think about it. I think, well, it is warm, you know, it mm-hmm. could be. And then I think, I don't want to swim anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then I get out. Oh, gosh. Everyone's going to think twice about lifting the lid on their toilet. Tonight, yeah. Tonight. Today. Just, yeah. Though that is sewer alligators. Of of all the of all the cryptid searches that we've talked about doing, this is the I would like to keep this towards the end of the list. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, it's a modern fairy tale. It is, yeah, it's and I think absolutely a modern fairy tale. And I've tried to take us on this journey from the uh, the ways that we've thought about what what lives beneath us, right? Yeah, um, and this seems like like modern sewage has given us it's our another type of creature, <laughs> I guess. Sure. Yeah. Well, like you said, something that has been sort of discarded that then yeah. can come back and be dangerous. Yeah. Well, all right. So should we should we pick our favorites then? Yeah. So let's see. So you had the gnome, you had mm-hmm. the mole man, and you had the sewer alligator. Um, I think I am going to go with the sewer alligator, believe it or not. Ooh, nicely done. Okay. Yeah, I just uh, I like the the modern like like we just said the modern uh, folklore of it, mm-hmm. um, because it's it's you know there's like that hint of truth, mm-hmm. and also because I mean, sure maybe not in New York, but obviously there are sewer systems where there are alligators. I can't imagine there's no alligators in the Florida sewer system. Right. I mean, they end up in people's pools and stuff. Yeah, they, and it washes back up, and then they do live and um, find extra food yeah. supply there. Right? But there's always sort of that, like, you know, there's 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 that cachet about New York City, right? And there's yeah. that idea that, like, it's not just an alligator living down there. Like, it's not just a two-foot-long no. baby alligator. It is something that has somehow tromped through toxic waste. It's big enough that we can imagine... Like New York City, I mean, is big enough that we can imagine it's become a playground for for that that kind of story and that kind of creature. Right. And now not only is it an alligator, but it is somehow even more monstrous it, mm-hmm. it, it or more intelligent or, or, you know, anything like that. So, yeah, I'm going to go with that one. Cool. That's a good. It's good. So you did uh, the dwarf. Yeah. The bauk. Yeah. The Groot slang. Yeah. And. As much as I loved delving into <laughs> the the minds of Moria and talking about the dwarf and and all of those things that are so I don't know so much a part of of my my imagination, I'm picking the Groot slang this time. Okay. Because of the 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 descriptive journey that we went on, <laughs> we said it's a it's a like you were like whatever you think it looks like, it's not that. Yeah. And then. It's a combination of a snake and an elephant, and I was like, "Okay, that that's interesting." And then, um, but is that what you thought of? No, and that's not exact. One hundred percent not. And then having it, um, the story of how uh, you know it was, the, the, they were one being, but too smart, too powerful, so they were split into snakes and elephants. Mm-hmm. Uh, loved it, and then tight uh, wrapped up in the neat little bow of. Um, looking like uh, a brontosaurus or yeah yeah well and i will say that when i first saw the groot slang i did think of a boom slang which is a Mm. type of snake and if you look up groot slang you will see pictures also of pythons and things like that okay sort of like a um possibility uh, as a possibility yeah okay okay now what was that movie where they find the, the the baby brontosaurus in the jungles baby baby that's what it was called okay yeah you see that's what like when he said that i was like oh, it's that and <laughs> yeah. that was my first uh like i don't know i really enjoyed the i enjoyed the visualization the journey of visualization that went along with the Groot slang i guess so now we can head back up to the surface i think thank goodness it's getting spooky down here all right well this has been the monster market and for Ben Hatke, I am Zach Gialongo. And for uh, Zach Gialongo, I am Ben Hatke. Benjamin Margaret Hatke. 
Congrats. Benjamin Margaret Hackey. Uh, think twice before you flush strange things down the toilet, folks. See you next time. Hey everyone, David Universe here, producer and audio engineer for Ben and Zach's Monster Market. On behalf of the team, thanks for listening. Music for this episode was created by Twinstrumental. If you'd like to see sketches of the creatures discussed on this episode, as well as other mystical goodness, please visit us at monstermarketpod.com, as well as Instagram and Facebook at monstermarketpod. For creature recommendations, or just to say hello, please email us at monstermarketpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, beware, because they be monsters out there. <laughs>